the big garbage back there for cell phones or any other distractions of that nature. And uh, there are plenty of seats today. We must have people out. Where are people out for today? What scholar they? No, we don't know. We don't know. Like bird flu will come back or something. Seems like we have a smaller crowd today. Um, but make sure you have a chair because uh, we'll be here a while. And it's beautiful. The next week's interim, and hopefully you're going to be rested and such and enjoy an awesome week. This morning, I have the privilege of introducing a member of the Greater St. John's community, St. John's and St. Ben's for that matter. Um, last year in my IB philosophy class, did anybody left who did that with me last year? Okay, thank you. Um, we, uh, my class had a cool opportunity to go over to uh, the graduate school for something called Theology Day, which I'm sure sounds tremendously exciting to all of you. What was exciting about this particular day was the subject matter which combined the topic of artificial intelligence, the human self, a search for meaning. I guess we could add all kinds of things to that, but many of those are going to get invoked today as well. And I don't want to steal uh, any thunder from our guest. Uh, the subject last year was conveyed, uh, spoken about, and we had a great chance to dialogue with Dr. Noreen Hertzfeld, who's with us this morning. Can you say hello? Um, Dr. Hertzfeld is the Nicholas and Bernice Ruder Professor of Science and Religion at St. John's University in College of Minnesota. Uh, and yes, that's Science and Religion, two very uh, cool topics uh, and not often put together in such a deliberate way. She holds degrees in computer science and mathematics from Pennsylvania State University and a PhD in theology from the Graduate Theological Union at Berkeley. She has a number of numerous articles in both academic journals and the popular press, as well as several books, including In Our Image, Artificial Intelligence and the Human Spirit, Technology and Religion, Remaining Human in a Co-Created World, and most recently, The Limits of Perfection in Technology, Religion, and Science. And I ask for your utmost attention this morning. You're going to have a lot of time to ask questions and to talk with Dr. Hertzfeld about these topics as she presents Outsourcing the Self. but I'm also a certified wine judge, but you guys are too young for that, so <laughs> we need to get a little older. Um, okay, when, uh, let's say about five, six, eight years ago, when I would start my intro class to computing down at the university, um, I used to just ask my students, and it would be about this time of day, how many of you guys have used a computer already today? And usually only a couple of hands would go up, um, and uh, anyway, we'd have a talk about that. You know, now I think that's actually kind of a silly question, isn't it? Well, let's try it. How many of you guys already used a computer today? That's what I thought. Yeah. yeah. I'm, actually, I'm sure all of you have. You know, let's face it. If you, 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 know, you probably used your cell phone. Um, you might have checked to social media already. But even if you haven't done that, you probably used the microwave or came here by car or something. And there's computers embedded in those things, too. So um, you've all used, well, actually, computers are you know, keeping the electricity going that are running the lights that we're sitting under. So we're all using computers all the time. They're absolutely ubiquitous in our life. And they're going to get more so. I mean, we're just seeing the beginning of the development of wearables with things like Fitbit and Google Glass and, you know, right now they're not that great, but they're going to get a lot better in a couple of years. So pretty soon, computers are going to be something we're going to, you know, put on in the morning and take off maybe when we go to bed or maybe not even take them off, you know, but have them with us all the time. Um, we are also putting so much of our lives onto the computer. I mean, when you think about it, um, all those pictures, you know, that you post to wherever you post them, Facebook, Instagram, uh, wherever, Snapchat, you know, um, the pictures of your lives are going up there, all of your thoughts that go out on Twitter or Yik Yak or something like that. Um, we're putting so much of ourselves into our machines 
And in a way, that's great, you know? We've got opportunities to um, keep stuff in the cloud, access it from anywhere. Um, but we're also losing a few things as we do that. And I think it's important for us to just be a little mindful of what we might be losing when we outsource uh, great parts of our lives for ourselves to the computer so that we might you know, at least be a little thoughtful of saying occasionally, ooh, do I want to do this? Or occasionally saying, okay, now I want to take a little time away from the machine um, because these are things I don't want to lose. So what are these things that I think might be a little bit in jeopardy as we outsource ourselves into the cloud and into cyberspace? I'm going to talk about three things briefly this morning, and then I'm going to give you guys a lot of time to think and talk about these things. But I think three concerns that I have is that we're outsourcing and losing a great deal of privacy when we put things out there, that uh, we may be losing our capacity to remember certain things, and we may also be remembering differently and that this plays into a different sense of self that we may be developing, which may be good or may be bad, but it's different than what it has been before. So, let's start first with privacy. Um, first of all, you probably all can't see this, um, but it says, you know, it's just amazing how much data is going into computers. Um, these days. It's, it's growing by about 30% a year. And, um, you know, we have all of these sources for our data, you know, all of our mobile devices, our social networks, um, things that we enter into computers or that our doctors or our insurance agents or our lawyers or who else enters into computers. Um, and then things that the computers themselves, you know, they talk among each other and pull a lot of data together. So there's relational data that's being filed about people where we're not actually entering the data, but algorithms are searching through data that's there and saying, hmm, that's interesting. Let's see, this person shops at this store online, and oh, they like these things on Facebook, and oh, they do, well, I can guess, you know, that this person must be, um, I don't know, you know, the computer made some assumptions about me. My mother has diabetes. The computer will assure I have diabetes. You know, they think I must be overweight in that case because most people with diabetes are overweight. You know, so I get all these ads for plus size clothing and stuff. It's kind of funny. Um, but the computers are thinking about you too and making up data about you. Um, now, the first thing we might think about when we worry about our privacy is hackers. Well, they're out there, okay. Um, whether they're you know sort of loosely organized like the group Anonymous, whether they're perhaps government sponsored like the the guys in North Korea, um, but there are, as some of the Hollywood stars would tell you at this point, good reasons to worry about hackers. You know, those nude selfies that you put up there might suddenly appear on the evening news, you know, or in uh, some tabloid press. Um, so there definitely are hackers out there looking for information. Now, those of us who aren't rich and famous probably don't have to worry quite as much as, uh, you know, J-Lo or somebody. Um, but we can also have trouble with just bad design. And this can be a particular issue with sensitive information like medical data. Um, you know, insurers would love to get their hands on all of your medical data. Uh, we're a little better off now with the Affordable Care Act that says, well, they got it sure anyway. Um, but still, uh, employers would like to get their hands on data like this. And if there are many software programs out there that just don't have the security measures that they should have. Um, there's also now the Internet of Things. Um, as more and more things get wired, um, you have more and more data about yourself. So if you've got a Fitbit, you know, it's sending data up into the cloud. And the question really is, who do you want to see that data? 
Um, Pew uh, did a survey on that, and they said, well, you know, most people feel pretty good about their spouse or significant others seeing it. That's the, you know, in the center there. Um, close friends, eh, maybe. Health professionals, you know, maybe. Um, then how about the police? How about your boss? How about insurance companies? How about ad companies? How about the government? And the really sad thing is that it's precisely the people in the blue and the green area who we really don't want to see our data who are seeing it. In other words, it is the ad companies, it is the government who are launching very sophisticated programs out there to try to see your data. Um, it probably isn't your close friends. Um, so we do have to worry a little bit about what data is out there on us and who is working really hard to take a good look at it. Um, the other thing is with the Internet of Things, you know, we can expect that pretty soon our houses will be wired. Um, energy companies is up on there. You might have thought energy companies, you know, why is Excel Energy going to care about any of my data? Well, that's the, one of the first places that is going to get wired. It's going to be our houses so that um, they can control, um, you know, when our conditioning is on, when it's off. Um, so that we can actually better use our resources for heating and cooling. Um, but at the same time, they can be getting a lot of information about when we're home, when we're not home, um, what's going on in our houses, what appliances we're using, things like that. Uh, so there's just going to be more and more information going into the cloud as more and more of our lives get wired. Okay, that's probably, oh well, then there is the NSA. I suppose we, we can't leave them out. Um, so before I end with privacy, you know, okay, all of your phone calls are being monitored. Get used to it. <laughs> um, second, let's talk a little bit about memory. Okay, these two pictures are up here. Um, the gal on the left is Stacy Snyder. Uh, she was a student at a um, Christian college, um, I think probably more like a Bethel type Christian college than a St. John's type Christian college because they asked the students all to take a pledge that they wouldn't drink while they were in college. We don't do that here. Um, so uh, she posted this picture uh, on Facebook, and, uh, or it might have been posted by a friend who took it probably was posted by a friend. Um, but it was found by the administration at the school, and uh, it was subtitled The Drunken Pirate or something like that. And so they tried to keep her from getting her, her teacher's credential um, on graduation because they said she had broken the school rules and engaged in behavior that was unbecoming for a teacher. Now, that's the thing, is, you know, you don't know who's looking at your Facebook pages. One of my students told me yesterday that, um, she said, you know, it's amazing. I didn't realize until I started searching for a job. She's a senior. She said, I'm looking for a job now. And almost every place where I apply, they, they want access to my Facebook page. And she said, and the interesting thing is that at one place they told me if I didn't have one, that would be a red flag for them. They'd be thinking, ooh, what do you have to hide? So she said, geez, you know, it's scary. I mean, not only do they want to see it, but you got to have one and have something out there. And all of a sudden she was rethinking a lot of things that she had posted. Um, the other guy uh, on the right, uh, his name is Andrew Feldman. He is, um, a professor in psychology, and you can see from the gray hair, not, not a real young guy. He was a young guy back in the 60s when a lot of people in psychology were like into thinking, hmm, well, let's see what the psychology of LSD is, and that kind of thing. So he was doing psychedelics and dropping acid and wrote some actually scholarly papers about this stuff. Um, and he lives in the United States, his son lives in Canada, and uh, he went to go visit his son and got turned back at the border because the border Googled him. 
they came up with these papers that said uh, he'd been dropping acid, and they said, nope, you know, you did, you did uh, felony drugs, um, you can't cross the border. So one of the problems with the computer is it remembers too well. There actually is a case to be made for forgetting. I mean, many of us do some crazy things in our youth, and we really don't want them to follow us for our whole life long. And generally, they wouldn't, you know? Uh, first of all, we'll probably move somewhere else when we grow up and get a job, and they won't know about the wild and crazy things we did when we were young. Uh, you guys don't, I'm sure, so you're all safe. But uh, some of the rest of us, you know, and back in the day, did some wild and crazy things. So now it can follow you forever. And uh, that can be a real problem. There is a need to forget, and computers don't forget. Um, you know, even if you stay in your hometown for the rest of your life, people forget. Or after a while, they just kind of shrug these things off and laugh and say, oh, yeah, you know, yeah, Dave Frewo was kind of a well guy in his youth, wasn't he? You know? Um, but yeah, he's an okay guy now, so um, people forget. And this is, there's a big difference, you see, between computer memory and our memories. You see, computer memory is sort of like a filing cabinet, it's static, you stick something in there and, and there it sits. Um, our memories are like a narrative, they're like an ongoing story that we tell. And over time, that story changes. Now, you may say, well, there, that's a problem, isn't it? That means our memories aren't that accurate over time. But that isn't always a problem. We work things out that way. It's, it's the way that we come to understand ourselves and to understand others. Um, so it's an unfolding story. Anthony Giddens said, a person's identity is not to be found in behavior, nor important though this is, in the reactions of others, but in the capacity to keep a particular narrative going. It's that narrative that just runs through your head all the time. The way you, you make sense of the things that happen to you in the world, the way you make sense of your life. As we put more and more things up into the cloud, I'm afraid that instead of our memory being like a storyteller, who's continually revising this narrative of, of who we are and what our lives are, we become more like scrapbooks instead, where we have snapshots, pictures, where we have, um, you know, Facebook entries, tweets, you know, kick-kick entries, things like that. And this makes for a very different sense of self, if you're just, um, you know, your scrapbook of all these pieces instead of an ongoing story. Um, so, and just a, another writer to quote about this sense of self. Madan Sarab said, why am I writing? Is my writing an attempt to put it all together? Does one have to rewrite the past in order to understand it? And this is the idea that narrative theorists come up with, is they said, you know what? We have to rewrite the past in our minds, and it's through that that we understand it. If our past is just a little scrapbook of bits and pieces, we won't necessarily understand it or understand ourselves the same way. Um, so, a little more about the sense of self. Uh, just, I think this came out about four days ago. There was an article in the New York Times that said that there's a new algorithm that's been launched and it's happily trolling Facebook, and it looks at all of your likes. And they said, you know what? This um, algorithm can figure out your personality about as well as a husband or wife or parent could figure out your personality. Really? Wow. I mean, you know, I told that to some of my students, you know, and about half of them said, wow, cool, you know? Um, but then I said, well, okay, yeah, that's kind of cool, I guess. But now think about it. Who is going to want to use that algorithm? You know? Um, well, you know, maybe uh, somebody you just met on first date is going to say, 
Oh, okay, tell me about this person's personality. Oh, without getting a chance to know you personally, they'll say, eh, introvert, nah, don't want, you know. Um, uh, bosses out in the workforce might decide, hmm, okay, I got all these candidates, let's go see what kind of personality they have. And immediately strike, you know, two thirds of the candidates off the list using this algorithm. They're not really getting a chance to meet you. They're only meeting what some algorithm says based on things that you say you like on Facebook. And that may not be a full profile of who you are, but they'll say, well, you know, study said it's pretty damn good, so we're going to go with it. Um, so I think that's something to worry about a little bit. Um, another thing to worry about, you know, kind of the usual thing, is that, um, you know, if we're logged in all the time, if we're on our devices all the time, you know, obviously we might not be paying attention to the people who are right next to us. And this came out yesterday, um, a study that said, uh, disconnected, a study suggests technology interferes with couple relationships. Uh, you know, right? Um, so, warning. You know, you want to have a good relationship with your boyfriend, girlfriend, put the damn machine down, all right? Uh, and actually spend time with them. Um, the article also talks about like things like addiction to video games and that kind of stuff, too. But a lot of it, they say, is, you know, you're having a conversation. I mean, how many of you have had this happen? You're having a conversation with somebody. Maybe you're saying something that you're really invested in, and all of a sudden their phone goes boink, you know, text coming in, and they grab it without thinking. And you're like, wait a minute, listen to me. You know, don't listen to your uh, phone. Um, OK, and so I want to end um, with the fact that my last worry is that our machines might make our lives too predictable. They'll know too much about us. They'll control too much in our environment. And they'll keep us from the unexpected. But it's so often the unexpected that brings something new and something marvelous and wonderful into our lives. So if we shelter ourselves too much with our machines, I think this might be the greatest thing we have to lose. And so I want to finish with a really short poem by Philip Larkin. This is the second verse that's up there. Um, but it's called Travelers. And it says, in trains, we need not choose our company. For all the logic of departure is that recognition is suspended. We are islanded in unawareness as our minds reach out to where we want to be. But carried thus impersonally on, we hardly see the person opposite, who if we only knew it, might be one who far more than the other waiting at some distant place knows our true destination. Okay, so you've been very patient and quiet, and thank you very much for listening to that. And now we're going to turn the lights on, and it's your turn to talk a little bit. <coughs> Questions, comments, thoughts? Yeah. Yes, they do, because what your brain is going to store is the picture, a picture of the picture, if you know what I mean. In other words, um, you know, if your experience of a place is mediated through your cell phone because you're taking pictures, um, a part of you is focused on the act of picture taking instead of just being there. And you will also see that picture over and over again and so the actual memory of the place will fade, and the picture is what's going to remain. Um, you know, is that good or bad? It's different, OK? Um, but I would say it's best, you know, to try maybe to do both. In other words, have a picture or two so you do have that memory. But then, you know, put, put the phone away and try to 
be there. The other thing is that when we're so into documenting our life, we don't, we are never fully present, like in the present moment, because we're always thinking about the act of documentation and kind of the future storage of this moment. And so I think it might also keep you from having quite as deep an experience where you are, you know, being quite as immersed in the present as you could be. Yeah. Why is it that you think that people have a right to be to have their actions forgotten at some point? Ah, why do people have a right to have their actions forgotten at some point? Um, you know, obviously there are probably some actions that we don't have a right to have forgotten. If I murder you, probably we're not going to forget that instantly, right? Okay. Um, but I do think that we change. We change a lot as people. Uh, I certainly have. Um, I don't think, you know, uh, for one thing, when I was your, your age, I was very, very shy and quiet. You know, I, I would have broken out in hives to stand in front of a group like this and talk. Uh, if the computer, like, stored that and said, well, this is her personality, um, well, no, not anymore, okay? Um, we also sometimes make mistakes. Um, you know, people engage in underage drinking or, you know, make a mistake um, like that. And to have, you know, these things follow you around well into your adult life, you know, like Andrew Feldman, who said, you know, okay, I'm gonna do some research on acid, but to have that follow him and keep him from, you know, visiting his adult son when the poor guy is pushing 70, it's not right. You know, in other words, we can be very judgmental as a society. If we weren't that judgmental, I'd say, yeah, well, it's no problem. But we are. And often we tend to make judgments not on our knowledge of a person, but on just some list of facts that we feed into an algorithm. And in that case, we can really misjudge people over the years. But I better go to the other direction. Yeah. Oh, golly. What is a healthy amount of time to spend on social media? <laughs> Suggestions? Uh, um, you know, I would say, one, often in the literature they say it's healthy to limit, your, limit the number of times a day that you check it to probably like no more than two. Now, I'll admit, I'm awful on that. I'm pretty good, actually I only check Facebook about twice a week. So I'm pretty good about that. And my Twitter account can languish for two weeks before I finally go, you know, by that time it's, I mean, there's a million in there so I don't read them all. Um, but email, I'm terrible. You know, I'm checking my email all day. Um, probably not a good thing. You know, I would probably be more productive if I did, as I said, check my email first thing in the morning and then checked it again at like three or four in the afternoon um, and stayed away from it in between. Okay. Yeah, back there. That was the first I heard of that, but several other of my seniors were nodding their heads. Um, and, you know, they were all saying they were surprised. Of course, they all had Facebook accounts. Um, but I don't know. I mean, your generation, by the time you get there, is probably not going to be, you know, Facebook isn't going to be the in thing anymore. But who knows? Maybe, maybe Facebook will still be out there. Um, that surprised me, you know. But uh, I could understand, the student said, that uh, the interviewer had said, well, if we get out there and there's no social media on you at all, it makes us wonder, A, are you antisocial? Or B, are you hiding something? You know, did you have accounts and now you've suddenly deleted them all? So, um, I don't know, it's a new thing. But it tells you something, doesn't it? It tells you how hooked into this um, into this computer world, into cyberspace, we are becoming as a society. Yeah. How do you think our increased access to technology has affected like, the overall human creativity? 
Ooh, how has our access to technology affected overall human creativity? I, I would not be inclined to say that it's made it any less, probably not any more either, but it's made it different. Um, one of the things that I think we're going to have to rethink as a society, precisely because of this not forgetting in the computer, is what creativity really is. Because, you know, in the past, we've said creativity is, is coming up with something really brand new. Um, well, we're still doing that to some extent, but also because so much is stored now, you know, you get to a certain point where you start thinking, wow, you know, it could get harder and harder and harder to come up with things that are new, isn't it? Um, so I think a lot of creativity is going to be doing mashups. You know, taking what's already out there and putting it together in a creative or a novel way. And we're going to have to start rethinking. Um, like, I've already had to start rethinking student assignments. The sort of traditional, you know, write a paper on the Bhagavad Gita or something is kind of silly. Because, you know, type in Bhagavad Gita analysis search in Google. And, you know, first, the first thing that will come up is five places that want to sell me a paper on the Bhagavad Gita. The next thing that's going to come up is five places that are giving away free papers on the Bhagavad Gita. You know, then it's going to come up a bunch of scholarly papers on the Bhagavad Gita. And, you know, I'm going to start to say, is there anything new that can be said about the Bhagavad Gita? You know, all you have to do is a little research out there. And what are you going to come up with? A mashup of what other people have already said. So, you know, I have to rethink, um, how do I make an assignment where you can do something truly creative um, and not end up going out to the web and saying, damn, it's already been done a hundred times. Yeah, back there and then up here. Uh, do you think that we use technology in you know, a long way? Do you think we should rethink our society and how we use technology to make how we use technology? Okay, do we need to rethink in our society how we use technology? Um, I think partially we need to rethink, um, we need to just put some limits on it. So far, we've, we've let the technology sector, the computer sector, the internet grow completely unlimited, unregulated, unbounded. Um, I think we're getting to a point where now we need to start thinking about limits. Um, and people are starting to bring this up. For example, people are starting to talk about should data have a shelf life? Um, okay, if the NSA is collecting all of our phone calls, how long should they keep them? Um, should we really be getting rid of some of this data at a certain point? I think we need to think personally about um, how much am I letting these gadgets and devices define me? How much am I letting these gadgets and devices run my life, demand my attention? Um, you know, I think it's pretty hard for a lot of us to ignore a ringing phone, but maybe there are times when we have to say, you know what, I'm shutting that thing off because I need some really quiet time that's not going to be interrupted by technology. So I think it's a question of rethinking where our limits are and should be, and be kind of deliberate about that. Okay, up here. Do you hear speech you offer in reference to the cloud? What exactly did you mean by that? Oh, the cloud. What is the cloud? Okay. The cloud is um, a reference, it's a metaphor, for um, the big computer data banks that are run by companies like Google and everything. Uh, companies like Facebook, where you upload data to their machines that are probably out in Silicon Valley or maybe in New York or something, and then you can access that data from a variety of devices. So basically the cloud is just saying it's when you upload your data to somebody else's machines um, because it gives you access from any device wherever you are the data is not in your own machine. So data, for example, when I type up an assignment for my class here at St. John's, it gets stored in servers, you know, over in the basement of the quad. Okay, that's not the cloud, okay, because that's local. 
But if when I put something on Facebook, it goes to Facebook servers, that's the cloud. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, yeah. Wait a minute. There's some back here first, and then I'll get to you. Excuse me? How much can a computer say it knows about you without you actually using social media? How much does a computer know about you without you using social media much? Well, it probably knows less, um, but it knows a lot, a heck of a lot. It, it all depends on how much you use the computer. Um, but if you shop online, if you browse the internet, um, you know, you leave a trail of where you've been. And there are businesses out there with algorithms that happily follow that trail and suck up that information. And then they make inferences about you. A um, couple of examples, uh, I was shopping about a year ago for a, I wanted a black trench coat. So I went to a few, you know, online sites looking at black trench coats, trying to figure out what I needed. Well, it, you know, it was kind of spooky because for about six months after that, every time I would get onto some site, even like the New York Times or something, there'd be an ad for a black trench coat on the side of the screen. I mean, I felt like you know, there was some goth army after me because every time I got on the computer, you know, there's all these people in black trench coats. And, uh, you know, it just means that it was out there. Everybody knew Noreen wants a black trench coat. And uh, it was followed by black trench coats. A worse one is that a young woman your age um, looked to, you know, was looking some stuff up online. And the next thing they knew, she received uh, in the mail at her parents' home a bunch of um, coupons uh, for baby things. And the algorithm had decided, looking at the trail of sites she had visited, that she was pregnant. And Target got a hold of that and said, well, if she's pregnant, she must need to buy all these things. Well, of course, her mom and dad opened this up, and they're going, what the, you know? And so, well, it turns out she was pregnant, but she hadn't told her mom and dad. Now, this is not the way you want your mom and dad to find out about something like this. So, yeah, they know stuff. And more than we would like them to know. But a lot of it is inference. You know, she did definitely type into the computer, I am pregnant. You know, they just looked at things she was reading and looking at. Okay, up here. Oh, uh, sure there are positive outcomes to being connected. No, it's not at all all negative. Um, when I tell you these negative things, it's because, frankly, I think you guys know the positive side, right? I mean, it's the negative side that we just tend to overlook because we're so enthusiastic about these devices. And, you know, what I'm trying to say is just be more careful, you know? Be more careful what you do out there um, because, you know, you are losing privacy. You are losing, um, you know, you may not be experiencing the world the same if you're always trying to take pictures of it. Um, so, you know, what I'm trying to say is we need a balance and we need to have some limits. But of course there are marvelous things. Um, you know, I love the fact that uh, I can be connected to, you know, to my significant other and send a text in the middle of the day and um, that I can be connected. Uh, I have a lot of colleagues and friends in Europe, you know. Um, gosh, I hate it. I remember when I was your age, um, I had a friend in Europe, you know, and I had to write on that really thin paper with blue envelopes and everything, you know. It would take a week to get there and a week to get a reply back. So, of course, it is not all native. Yeah. How did I become interested in this? Um, interested in what? Be more specific. <laughs> Okay, um, yeah, 
Uh, well, it's kind of a long story. Um, if you listened at all to what Dave read about my background, I actually started out uh, in mathematics. And um, in mathematics, I was doing formal logic and graph theory. And those are areas that are really heavily used in the theory of computing as well. So I ended up taking a few courses in computing. And I thought, oh, actually, this is more interesting than the plain mathematics. So I switched from mathematics to computer science. Um, and then it's, it's interesting. I was in mathematics to start with. Remember I told you how shy I was when I was your age? And I thought, you know what? People are messy. Uh, they're, they're changing their minds, they fight with each other, they do all sorts of messy things. Numbers are nice. You know, numbers do what, what they are expected to do. You know, so I want to go into math where it's all clean and nice and it's not messy. Um, and then I got from that into computer science thinking, well, computers are nice too. They do what you tell them to do. You know, so this is okay. Um, then I came here and started teaching computer science. And after a while I started thinking, you know what, this is boring. You know, just teaching the theory, the, the mechanics behind computing. And so what started to interest me instead was how we were using these machines and like human-machine interaction and artificial intelligence and, and things like that. In other words, it got to be, maybe as my personality started changing and I wasn't so shy anymore, that I started thinking, you know what, it's precisely the messy humanness that is really interesting because it does change all the time. And that's what makes it exciting. Okay, yeah, first here and then in the back. Yeah, yeah. So she made a really good observation. She said, you know what, uh, computers were initially developed so that we could do things quicker and more easily, um, but now we've gotten kind of dependent on them and they're actually taking a great deal of time away from us. Um, is that irreversible? Uh, no, it's not irreversible, but it isn't always easy. Um, computers love to suck up time. They really do. I mean, have you ever found that you sit down at your computer and then you look up and you look at the clock and you're like, whoa, you know, where did the time go? Um, so we do need to think, uh, again, I'm just asking you, be, be a little more deliberate about it. Um, you know, I find uh, one of the biggest things that will suck up my time, okay, you know, more confessions here, um, is online games. No? And I'm sure none of you have that problem. But, uh, you know, and I'm kind of old, but to tell you, when I was doing my doctorate, um, the one, I, I got really proficient at Minesweeper. Now, that goes way back, right? But uh, I'd sit down, okay, I'm going to work on my dissertation, and then I'd say, oh, well, wait a minute, first, just one game of Minesweeper, and kind of get me in the mood. You know, and then it would be like 45 minutes later, uh, whoa, I'm not working on my dissertation, am I? Um, now, of course, it's, it's other, other games that every once in a while I'll sit down and I'll think, okay, just one, you know, while I wait for this, and a half hour later, it's like, uh, Marie, you know? So, um, yeah, computers will suck up our time, and it's not irreversible, but you have to be really mindful and tell yourself, okay, I'm, I'm not checking email now. I'm gonna do it later. Uh, I really am only gonna play one round of this, you know. Um, in fact, sometimes I'll have to like say it out loud, okay, only one, you know, <laughs> and play a little bit, and it's like, only one, okay, you know, shut the machine. Um, you have to be deliberate to keep them from sucking up your time. Okay, way in the back. Uh, Mr. Primo pointed out when you started that uh, you have a, you also stu you study the religious aspect of all this, where, but we haven't heard any mention of that in your talk. Where, where does that fit into all this? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Technology does not want to hear about religion. <laughs> 
<laughs> These things have a life of their own, you know. Um, obviously, the technology did not want me to talk about religion. Said, no, wait a minute, you're talking about te us, you're talking about us. Narcissistic technology. Um, where does the religion come in? Uh, for me, it came in uh, when I was teaching a class on artificial intelligence. And I started thinking, you know, there's lots of philosophers who have written lots of stuff about could we build a computer that thinks the same way a human being does, that is just like us. And, uh, you know, I thought, well, okay, that's an interesting question, but you know what, why do we even want to? Why do we want a computer that's just like us? Because really, computers are most useful to me when they're doing the stuff I can't do. You know, crunching the really big numbers and, and holding the really big data and, and doing the really boring stuff that I don't want to do. So why is it that we were so invested in the idea of artificial intelligence? Um, so I came up for my first sabbatical and I thought, you know, nobody has explored this question. I think there's a good question. I'll explore this question. Uh, write a paper, maybe write a book or something on it. And uh, I got to exploring the question and all of a sudden I realized, oh shoot, I can't answer this question because this really isn't a technological question. And all my background was technological. But this is a question about human motivations. In other words, you know, why do we want something so much? And I thought, okay, well, to answer that, I mean, we have to study psychology or religion. Well, I came back to St. John's with very little accomplished on my sabbatical, and then I thought, oh, psychology or religion, we do have a school of theology here on campus, that's kind of convenient. So I'm going to take a couple of classes, um, you know, human anthropology and that kind of thing, and then maybe I can get at my question. And so I took a couple of religion classes, and then I thought, whoa, this is fun, I'm going to take a few more. And then I took a few more, and then I thought, whoa, this is fun. And, you know, I took a few more, and then I said, wow, a few more, and I got a master's degree. You know, why not? Uh, so I went for it. And by that time, I was starting to think theologically. And the thing I started thinking about on my question was, you know, what did it say in Genesis 1? Okay, so I didn't get too far into the Bible. But I got into Genesis 1, and it says, we are made in the image of God. And I thought, okay, this is interesting. We are not like God, but here we are, and we think we're in the image of God, and now we want to make the computer in the image of us. And I thought, whoa, image, image. Is it the same image, or is it a different image? In other words, uh, is what we share with God what we also want to share with the computer? Or is it different? Or are we standing in the middle and projecting what we value most out in both directions? In other words, are we kind of narcissistic ourselves and we're projecting what we think about ourselves onto God and onto the computer? And so it was exploring that question um, that uh, led to my doctorate in religion and my first book, In Our Image, which obviously you can guess was all about that question about image. If you want to know the answer, you've got to read the book. <laughs> yeah. That is a very, I mean, an obviously very good point. It's not really the computer that sucks up our time. It's us. You know, we give the time to the computer. Um, you know, the computer can't reach out and grab you. And, uh, it, you know, it's metaphorical that the computer kind of grabs you. Um, and what can we do to keep the computer from sucking up so much of our time? Um, the biggest thing that I think, I would say two things. Okay, the first one I kind of already mentioned is I think if you th sit and think about 
how much you really want to be in front of that screen, and then set some limits for yourself. In other words, tell yourself, okay, I'm only going to check, you know, my cell phone X number of times a day. I'm uh, only going to spend an hour right now sitting in front of this screen, and maybe I'll even just set a timer. Yeah, you know, I'll set the timer on my smartphone, and when the bird starts tweeting, I'll know it's time to get off the computer uh, and go do something else. The other thing that we can do, which I think is even more important, is just get involved in a lot of other activities that you want to do. You know, in other words, have other hobbies that don't involve the screen time. Um, get outside, get active. Uh, when you meet with friends, agree with your friends that you're going to leave your phones in the car or something while you go do something. And so, you know, as you get involved in other things, um, those things will draw you away from the screen and into doing them. intelligence. Um, one of the reasons that I think many people are trying to develop an artificial intelligence is they believe it's going to make our computers easier to work with and relate to. Um, but, but this one person said no, he didn't want to get involved with artificial intelligence because he's concerned that the computers are going to evolve faster than we can and eventually surpass us um, and probably take over. And there are plenty of books and probably movies you know, out there that I'm sure you guys have seen um, on precisely this subject. Um, personally, I'm not worried. As a computer scientist, I know uh, that we are... It's true, people often talk about um, Moore's Law, and Moore's Law says that um, Computer power is going to double about, you know, every six months or so, um, and that, it does, but that's only hardware. Our software writing capabilities have not uh, improved that much over the last few years. So we really don't know how to write the software that would really run a good artificial intelligence, and I'm not sure we will. Now, lately, people have said, well, what we really need to do is reverse engineer the brain. In other words, we need to figure out how our, the neurons in our brain are wired together. And then if we can wire a computer together that same way, the computer will have a brain, you know, just like ours. Um, again, I'm not real worried that we're going to do that real soon. For one thing, there's the uh, question of scale. There are billions of neurons in your brain. We're not up to that scale yet. Right now, we can wire a computer to match the brain of an earthworm. Well, okay, you know, an earthworm. Um, we haven't even managed a fruit fly yet. A fruit fly is too complex for us. Um, so thinking that within, like Rick Kurzweil thinks that by 2030, we're going to re reverse engineer the human brain, I don't think so. Not if we're at the earthworm right now. Um, the other thing is, okay, the wiring in our brain is all that's going on up there. When you have a new experience, when you learn something new, guess what you're doing? You're rewiring your brain. In other words, your brain isn't just wired one way and it stays that way. It's constantly changing. And uh, so learn a lot of stuff. Your brain keeps growing, it keeps changing. It can even pop in some new neurons. You know, um, then go out and have a few drinks, and you'll pop out quite a few neurons. So, you know, but we're popping them in and out, um, and we're rewiring them. And besides that, our brains are bathed in these chemical neurotransmitters, uh, things like dopamine and serotonin, and those guys play a really big role as well. And so there's and and the computer scientists 
haven't begun to think about how they could mimic the role of these chemical transmitters. So, um, you, know, you know, when you hear people saying, oh, artificial intelligence is right around the corner and they're going to take over, um, that does not keep me up at night. That's not going to happen, not in the near future. Uh, it, is it time? Time for one more quick question. Okay, you've already asked a question. Somebody who hasn't asked a question. Okay, over there. When I was a kid, we heard a lot about the tobacco industry and, and everything that they did was, frankly, diabolical in its cleverness at hooking people into using their product. Do you see the same kind of thing happening with the, these technology companies today? I mean, you make it sound very easy for, for kids to well, set limits and you, you know, you have a uh -huh. But it um, seems to me that these some of these companies so good at designing the products yes. that makes it virtually impossible for a person to set limits quite so easily. Okay, yeah, the, I think, he, yeah, he is absolutely right. Um, you know, just as the tobacco industry looked for ways to make their product and their advertising hook people in, uh, so does the computer industry. Uh, the part of it that I'm versed on is the video game industry. Um, video games are deliberately addictive. They are designed to be addictive. And in fact, the video game producers, um, they go to psychological conferences and they have studied up to learn precisely what it takes to make something addictive. Um, and they, you know, you know, exactly how much reward do you need to give at exactly what places? Exactly how unpredictable should the game be in exactly what ways? Um, exactly, you know, how do we make you keep wanting to get to the next level or to beat your own time or something? And so you're right. It's, uh, you know, hey, exhibit one, you know. It's not easy. These things are designed to be addictive. I think it's helpful to know that so that, um, you know, when the computer does suck you in, you, first of all, you say, oh, yeah, got me again. Um, but then you say, okay, next time I'm going to do something to make sure it doesn't. I'm going to set a timer on my phone. I'm going to do something um, so that it doesn't suck me in. Or tomorrow afternoon, I'm staying off the machine. It's not easy to set those limits, but I think when you know, when you become more simply aware of your relationship with the computer world, you know, step back and look at yourself and say, is this what I want? And uh, if you say, yeah, I'm pretty happy, great. If you say, you know what, <laughs> I didn't get that paper written when I'm getting a crappy grade and it's all because I stayed up playing World of Warcraft all night. I've got to find ways, whether it's telling a buddy to phone you up, you know, and tell you not to do it, or setting a timer on yourself, or saying, I'm going outside, the sun is shining. Um, find ways to step back and look at yourself, and if you don't like what you see, you can change. You really can. Thank you very much. And you don't have to be a tinfoil hat wearing conspiracy theorist, not that I am anymore, but if you follow news uh, and economics at all, this will make Mr. Riker happy, right? Do you know what big news Apple just announced last quarter? Record profits of any company in the history of the world, and maybe they're just saying that, but we believe it because it's Apple, right? That's a whole lot of money that was earned from a whole lot of devices designed to consume time, resources, and so on and so forth, right? That, I'm not indicting them. They're brilliant. They're brilliant, right? Every single one of you was given one of these devices. One simple test that I would ask you to do, just as a reality check, if you plug it in and charge it every night, and hopefully you do that, the next night, so maybe try this, well, when we get back to school, because then it'll screw everything up. But come back with a full charge. At the end of the day, you can go into your settings and see how much time that was operated during the day with the screen on. 
two years ago I didn't have one of these things, or they had one as a test program for teachers to give to you, right? I went from having zero time on an iPad because I didn't own one, to, I did this for a week, 12, 13 hours a day. In one year's time, I went from zero to that. Some of you are kicking my butt with that time, of course, right? That's a huge reality check, and I just encourage you to think that. Thank you, Dr. Hertzfeld.